All right, we are firing through, and thank you for everybody tuning in to this new showtime every Friday and Saturdays, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. Central Standard Time. Is it standard? I don't know. Maybe it's not standard. 8 p.m. Central? Yeah, Central Time. Mm-hmm. Why did I say standard? I'm just all messed up from 420 yesterday. I'm sorry <laughs> about that, ladies and gentlemen. But um, we are going to ex- extend the broadcast an extra hour for you guys. So we'll be going until midnight Central Time. But right now we have Chris Barrett who's going to be joining us. But first, Donnie Gilson is going to write Shotgun with us for the first hour and talk about the hollow earth with Chris. Donnie, how are you doing? Hey, how are you guys? Oh, doing great, doing great. You're working on a new video, aren't you? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm uh, I'm an intense research man. I uh, have come across some really odd stuff. We were up until we were broadcasting last night until about close to four in the morning, five in the morning, and all kinds of different networks where we were having a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, we're uh, I'm I'm going deep into research right now. So another video is going to be coming out fairly shortly. Oh, nice, nice. Can you give us a little sneak peek on it? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, what we've been talking about now is the possibility of this, uh, this gas giant in between, uh, Neptune and, uh, Uranus. Uh, but, uh, we have now, uh, taken a look at, uh, a couple other elements, uh, down at Nearmar Station that gives us, uh, a weird planet is rising from, uh, near Mars station in the east uh, through cloud cover. So it means that this object is a little closer than we than we think. And uh, it, ha- it haps- happens to be in the same precise area where Mercury is. But of course, we can't see Mercury in the sky. Uh, so what is this planet? Uh, we are going to investigate it and we are going to find out something very, very interesting when we go to the exact coordinates of where this, uh, this uh, particular object is. Huh. That's all tight. Very strange. Well, let me ask you this. Your opinion on Hollow Earth real quick before we run Chris on. Um, I am a I, I'm an avid believer in the Hollow Earth theory. I don't uh I, I believe in subterranean uh uh People, I believe in subterranean civilizations. Uh, one of mo- one of the uh, people that I've worked with over my life is a lady named Diane Robbins. Uh, she is uh, uh, a channeler who has uh, uh, spoken with people from the underground uh, civilization called Telos, which is supposedly below Mount Chasta. Ah, yes, I've heard about that. And as a matter of fact, that's where Stephen Sindoni was talking about an entrance to the hollow earth in Mount Shasta. And Chris Barrett is a good friend of Stevens and is going to elaborate on the hollow earth. Chris, do we, do we have you with us? Yeah, I do. First off, thank you for having me on. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know too much about you. So tell the audience, please. And myself too, a little bit about yourself. And if you have any websites, anything like that. Well, uh, first off, um, my name's Chris Baird. I go by Center Star, so I have Stent- Center Star's channel on YouTube, on uh, Daily Motion, on Wire Club, which is another forum like Facebook. Uh, not Facebook yet. I'm under Christopher Baird on Facebook, but I'm going to put a Center Star's channel there too as well. And I just recently started a website with the help of my friend Steve Sandoni, and it's Center Star's channel dot webs dot com and uh pretty much uh what i've been doing is well let let me go back a little bit what happened was i had just stumbled across hollow earth i was doing some spiritual searching and some research and i went from place to place to place on videos just watching things and i stumbled across one of steven's videos which was on the smoky god and it talks about the story of Jans and Olaf Jansen and uh, their journey to Hollow Earth. Well, about six months after this, I went and, and, and almost a year to the day last year, on April 23rd of 2011, I went to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science in Denver, Colorado. And you live locally. I don't know if you've been to that museum yet. Have no, you? We, we've only been here about a year, so we haven't had too much yeah. time to explore well, yet. Check it out. It's pretty neat. Um, they have this thing called the Space Odyssey Center. And being that I was really starting to get interested in Hollow Earth, I wanted to just go in and see if any of their pictures showed uh, auroras at the poles and showed any pole holes at the poles of the planets. And they had a brand new display in there. 
um, that was a silk screen display that I later found out that they can put images of the sun or the different planets on there. But what they had on there that day was a silk screen globe of the earth and a gentleman next to me wanted to see Alaska and he tilted it down and all they showed it in the north for any representation was just open water. Um, I ran around behind the wall just hoping to see Alaska or sorry, not Alaska, but Antarctica down there. And uh, they had it. And not only did they have it, they had a representation that had a hole in the South Pole. So I snapped two pictures. And at this moment, you have to understand it's it's it would be almost like seeing Jesus in front of you. You know what I mean? When it comes to hollow earth, this is like the holy grail to me. I'm standing there. I'm shaking. I'm going, oh, my gosh, hollow earth may just be real, you know. And so I snap these pictures. I'm really nervous. And I walk by the guy and I said, do you realize that your your representation of Antarctica has a hole in it? And that guy got really nervous and looked at me and kind of nodded his head and said, yes. And I got my kids and I got out of the museum. So after that, this last year, um, I, I about September, October, there was that uh, crab fishing show on TV. <laughs> that we all know about on a certain channel about discovery. And um, there was a, a picture on there of the North Pole, and it showed an indentation at the top where the central rotational axis is. And there was a big, huge hole in what I later figured out after doing some research was Baffin Bay, a gigantic hole with steam coming out. So I had already been looking into hollow earth and all these things. And I, and, and I started to remember as a child wondering where the, the North pole lights come from and, and, uh, and some of the biblical references I wanted, I, I know I always wondered, uh, what was this, uh, pillar of light or in other words, the firmament that God used to divide the waters from the waters. Could it be the North pole or lights? And, I started thinking about all these things and I thought, you know what, I need to start thinking about how this actually works more than, you know, is it real or not real? To me at that point, it was real. So what I decided to do was take everything that I could figure out about how I thought it worked and, uh, and then uh, put it together in a series where people could see me draw drawings and, and I call it Hollow Earth Under World View. And that is on YouTube. It's on Daily Motion, and it's also on that website. Along with some of my pictures, are on the website for people to see. Well, there's definitely a cover up going on. I mean, satellite images are prohibited from viewing the North or South Poles. Google Maps or Google World, I should say, Google Earth is what it's called, um, covers it up and just has completely taken out any signs of ice or anything. I mean, and if you zoom up real close, what do you see? You see a hole in there which I don't know if that's just the way that everything is rendered or if it's a coincidence or maybe they're, they've covered up a hole, but you can still see a little remnants of it. But uh, there's definitely a cover-up. Now, my question to you would be, what is this hollow earth like? Do you have any ideas on that? Well, first off, you have to understand there's two different theories on the way it works. Now, Galley Galileo uh, is reported that maybe have been the first to suggest that there was a hollow earth. But this would have been during the time that he was um, the, the time that he was under house arrest. See, he had put out his theories about the sun not being the center of the or sorry, the earth not being the center of the universe anymore. But the the sun was and he was tried for heresy and he was found guilty. If he'd been a woman, he would have been burned at the stake. Um, so they gave him a a slap on the wrist really for that time that day he was pretty popular and so he he backed off from it but then a couple years later he decided to go right back into it again and they retried him and this time they put him under house arrest well 10 years later uh sir edmund haley was born and sir edmund haley actually put out in the public the hollow earth theory and there's a really famous picture of him holding like a globe and that globe's cut up open and what his kind of idea was as far as i can tell is that the earth is like an onion and you take out every other layer of that onion and you have multiple layers all the way through the earth with the center sun and in, inside of that. Then there's a second theory that's just that there's a floating crust around this inner sun and then that's it. And that's the one that I go with. And for people to get a better visual of this, just 
um, again, I don't make any money doing uh, off of doing this. And I'm going to throw out somebody else's video so that your viewers can look and see exactly what it looks like. Um, look up Hollow Earth 3D on YouTube right now and pull up that video. Turn down the volume so you can hear the show that's going on. And there's a good, actual, well done video that's going to show a cutaway of the earth and show that sun floating in the center and what it looks like with the crust. So, wow. Donnie, any thoughts on that? I know you uh, posted some coordinates. Yeah, I just uh, shot uh, some coordinates uh, to the hollow earth entrances down there in Antarctica. Uh, these are man-made uh, or alien-made entrances. Of course, one looks like the Darth Vader helmet. It's kind of uh, odd-looking. Uh, but there's there's been several uh, discussions in regards to subterranean uh, type of, you know, I mean, Hitler himself in, uh, you know, people, you know, have stated that Hitler uh, escaped World War II took a submarine down to South America. At that point, he caught a, uh, a ship. They sailed to Antarctica. And at that point, he went uh, and took refuge in the hollow earth. Um, I, I am a true believer. Since, since, since I started in college uh, back in the 90s, I really started investigating the hollow earth. And I am more on the lines with, uh, with your guest's uh, assumption on the second hypothesis as well. Hmm. Well, that... Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go no, right no, ahead. Go ahead. Um, what I was going to say is that once you understand that there is this this idea of hollow earth, you have to throw out a few assumptions. Um, one of them is this Pangea idea where we had all the body of land in one little uh, landmass and an ocean all around it. OK, that goes off the assumption that we have a solid earth theory. But once you understand it's hollow, you understand that due to centrifugal force, the crust of the earth is slowly moving out and it would start out slower at the beginning and it would speed up as as the crust started to thin out. And what we find in the Pacific Ocean is that the in the Pacific Ocean, the oldest seafloor that they found in the Pacific Ocean is 70 million years old. So just prior to the extinction of the dinosaurs. All right. And before that time, as we know, um, there was a there was a time where most of the earth was completely covered in water. So there's another theory, and I'm not going to go into that whole thing, called expanding earth. And that's another theory that I follow rather than the idea that we are on plate tectonics just floating around at random. I think that our that we're in the same position. However, the crust has expanded over time and the oceans are slowly falling away well, and into these depressions that are built up. That's interesting that you state that uh, because what we, uh, Chris Gio and I have, and Cherie have talked about in uh, in time is uh, this new image of the Earth that came out uh, recently in regards to uh, NASA's look at what the Earth looks like. And the Earth, we, we came up with two, thir- two, two theories, either the Earth is expanding or the Earth is uh, is actually shrinking, and there's a very good video out on YouTube of, in regards to the expanding Earth uh, uh, thought process and theory. And actually, uh, the the guy who created that I don't have his name off the top of the head. I had an in depth conversation with him. He's out in New York. He's a comic book. Uh, he's actually a comic book uh, creator, uh, but he's the one who uh, basically came up with the uh, talking about these uh, these plates as they move and they expand, and the Earth itself is actually expanding almost into an egg shape well and i think i think personally i think there there's more than one pole hole um at the pole regions okay and the other thing is, is i think the pacific is expanding at a higher rate than the atlantic and it's kind of doing a deal where you're compressing the atlantic side while the pacific side seems to be expanding faster i don't know if that's 100 percent for real But it seems to me like if Baffin Bay was the original large pole hole, that it's pushed that that pole hole from the rotational axis of the Earth down a bit and squeezed it on one side. So um, also moving on a little bit, um, I had some some ideas, you know, uh, of course, Olaf Jansen called the inner sun the smoky god. All right. So we know. That, that it was smoky and we know that it was dark on one side versus the other side. Well, I had a, I had some theories on this uh, after looking at it for quite a while. 
And what I've come to is that the inner sun is hot all around, all right? But it's got a cooler side. In other words, as the inner sun cools off, you're going to have a slighter lower temperature crustal layer of denser matter. And that denser matter, I think, is going to coagulate towards the side of the highest point of gravity. Well, the highest point of gravity in our solar system is our outer sun. So what this means is that we have daytime on the outside of the Earth while we have nighttime on the inside of the Earth. And we have daytime on the inside of the Earth while it's nighttime out here. Kind of interesting to wrap your brain around. Um, the representation for this inner sun is all over the face of the Earth, and people would be shocked to know. Look at the yin and yang. Look at... Uh, in, in Lhasa, Tibet, they have tons of uh, yin-yangs that are around with circles around them. And I think that those are just uh, the mandalas and some of those other things are just representations of the hollow earth. And interestingly enough, you mentioned the Germans in, you know, they went down there in 1936. And yes, one, I, I can't name the guy, but one of the guys said, my Fuhrer is safe and he's in the land underneath the ice. Of course, we know that's New Schwabia. But another thing they did is racial profiling, trying to find the Lemurian ancestors in Tibet. And they actually went to Lhasa and to Patella Palace. And Patella Palace is one of the cooling systems for the inner earth as well. Uh, it's, it's actually a cave system. And that's another reason why the Chinese have taken and kicked the original Dalai Lama out, who was forced to India and have installed their own. They don't want people going there and being able to access any of this knowledge. Um, there's interesting stories about Christ having traveled the world, uh, you know, and he, he went to Tibet, but he also showed up in the Americas and he could have easily done that traveling through these earth, inner earth systems. Ah, I've yeah. never thought about yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. The, and uh, so some of the listeners that uh, are not familiar with what, what Lemuria is, Lemuria is uh, uh, another continent that uh, has disappeared as, as such as Atlantis. It was on the Pacific coast called the land of Mu. Yeah, the Lemurians, you know, when you go into um, Lemuria and all that, see, you have to understand there's going to be some different terms here that you need to understand. We have the hollow earth, then we have middle earth, and then we have the surface of the earth. There are lots of reported middle earth civilizations too. Um, what's interesting enough is that the water inside the earth is fresh. It's artesian spring. It's, it's pure water. Yep. It gets filtered through the layers down, and it comes out in a gigantic fountain called the navel of the earth into a garden called the cradle of life, which is also called Eden. Well, hold that thought, Chris. The cradle of life. That sounds really fascinating. Kind of like the fountain of youth. There you go. Well, he referred to it as Eden. So we'll see right on the other side, right here on Truth Frequency Radio. As you can tell, I'm just kind of sitting back and just trying to take all of this in because I've never heard a hollow earth perspective like this one. We'll be right back with Donnie Gilson. Hollow earth, one of my favorite topics, and I love getting different perspectives on it. We've had Christopher Everard, Stephen Sinjoni, many more talking about it. And this is the first time that I've heard the term the cradle of life, which is the Garden of Eden. So let's go back to Chris Baird. And Chris, please pick it up from there. So this uh, cradle of life, the Garden of Eden, is in the city of Eden. And as far as I know, it's in Argotha. I've heard some people say Lemuria. And this is where um, Jans and Olaf Jansen were fortunate enough to be allowed to go. And uh, during their journey, uh, they were just some uh, Norwegian fishermen who traveled north and they were in search of their gods, Odin and Thor. They were going to get some uh, ivory. And I think they wound up around uh, Greenland and went up Baffin Bay and went in. And uh, after their first year where they learned the language of these people, um, they, they were invited to go to Eden and talk to the ruler there so they could get permissions to uh, see all the lands inside of the earth. And what's interesting enough is these people are very tall, okay? 
the people towards the North Pole that they had met, that they met on a, that were on a ship at the time, we're talking 1829, it was self-propelled and giant. They stood anywhere from nine to 12 feet tall, all right? In the city of Eden, which is reported by uh, another gentleman called Colonel Billy Fay Woodard, who is a gentleman who uh, claims that he is actually Argoth and, and is from the inner earth and was left here with the sister on the outside. You can look him up and find out that information. We, right, right. We yeah, he says that, that, that's, uh, that it's located right underneath Missouri where the big golden arch is. Now, so that would let you know something. What I'm getting into here is at the city of Eden, this, this ruler stood 15 to 16 feet tall, all right? And we're not even to the equator yet. So once you get to the equator inside of the earth where the crust is even thinner and more thinned out, you could have giants as big as 20 to 50 feet tall, all right? So Which is we're not I just talking those video. animals, you know. Sorry, go ahead. I, what I was going to say is uh, recently I showed uh, a uh, video on one of my videos in regards to these large, uh, it looked like they could have been anywhere between 15 to 20 feet tall, uh, Anunnaki, which is what I called them, uh, down in Peru. Uh, it was a very compelling uh, video that uh, was shot by a local in Peru that uh, uh, went all over the internet. for. Uh, it was filmed back in March of 2010, uh, but uh, it's very compelling the most recent picture i've even seen that uh show something is uh when the north korean uh leader uh kim young ill or whatever his name is kim, kim young, yep died. yep kim jong yeah, yeah, yep picture there were some giants in it and they yep. went in and airbrushed them out that showed up to his funeral yep <laughs> so so they went in and they airbrushed them out but they had some of these large inner earth guests i think at his funeral there um, so, so wrapping, wrapping this all around, you know, the, <coughs> you look at Eden being inside the earth. That's where I was kind of going with the Jans and Olaf Jans and connection there for the moment. Um, you start to look at the biblical story of Adam and Eve and you think here they were, they were driven out of the garden of Eden. Well, literally they were probably driven to the face of the earth. Okay. And there were beings both in the earth and out of the earth at that time. And then Cain, he slays his brother. Abel, and God punishes him. And he right. looks at God and he says, God, my punishment is more than I can bear. For this day, you have driven me from your face and from the face of the earth, and I must dwell in it. And everywhere I go, they will slay me. So God gives him a mark to protect him from being killed by everybody for committing the quote unquote first murder of the time in our religious Bible, the way it's written. Also, in the story of Noah in the current King James Version, it says that God came in, whatever was acting as God or our gods came in, angry and destroyed the fountain in the Garden of Eden, the fountain, fountains of the deep. And all the waters went out of the poles and went over the face of the earth. Okay. So, so if you look at it that way and you think, here we have this gigantic artesian spring that's feeding four gigantic rivers that due to centrifugal force, if you do a little scientific experiment at home, you put water in a cup and you spin it, the water wants to climb out, okay, of the glass. Well, it's the same thing in there. Slowly the water from this giant fountain may climb up and out of the poles and, and go to the surface of the earth, and then they're sucked back down through the aquifer, okay? So... You look at that and then you understand that twice as much water was now on the outside of the earth. And that the flood very well could have happened. Hmm. Very true. I mean, we were here at some peak. I don't remember what the peak was, but it's where Buffalo Bill is buried. And we were looking down and there was a big sign there and it showed how several thousand years, maybe millions of years ago, everything here was completely underwater. Now, we're at 6,500 elevation up on that peak, it was probably 7,500, if not 8,500, mm -hmm. but it, it just goes to show. I think you're absolutely right. Everything was underwater at one point in time. Also you have in first Samuel 28, uh, it was, uh, I think it was somebody, the King said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see God's coming up out of the earth. 
Ah, very interesting. We have Stephen Sindoni joining us as well. Stephen, how are you doing? Stephen. Oh, okay. I think he's there, but I think he's still muted up. But Chris, do you want to pick it up? Well, um, let me see where we're at here. I have a little list of stuff I'm going through, so I want to make sure I hit it all. Oh, man. Um, you're, you're, it's going fascinating back, Going so back to um, the inner sun and the outer sun in the day and night, I want you to kind of visualize us on the outside of the earth right now. I want you to think about the fact that you have a crust below you, an inner sun, another crust, and then at nighttime, you have the outer sun. Think about that gravity and how it pulls down your body. Okay. And also the gamma rays and how it hits you. Okay. So that's a lot, a lot of gravity and negative direction pull on your body. Now, remember, I told you it's daytime in the earth during, during our nighttime and, 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 and nighttime during our daytime. Okay. So if you imagine now you're standing on the, the inside of the crest during your daytime, all you have below your feet during that time is the crust right underneath your feet above you is the inner sun above you is the other side of the crust and above you is the outer sun. So all that gravity is lifting you up and lifting your spirits and your body up at your head. And so these people live in a different dimensional level to where literally to where they're lifted up, their spirits are higher they have less gravity, less pull on their body, and, and so they have wonderful health. They live for thousands of years in the same body. And what I mean by the same body is these people are in, in their society, they live to the point where they, they work at sustaining life, and they also meditate, and they live in crystalline cities. They don't have roofs on their houses. Everybody works together. They have a world of plenty. They have not destroyed their Eden. And out here, we've destroyed everything. Right. You know, we, we're, right. we're under this illusion of money and we're just crunched down. And, and, and that's such a big, huge difference. That's another thing I want to point out to people is if we could even have a, a taste of what that feels like. Um, you know, another good way to understand it is. I used to work in a nursing home and we always knew when it was a full moon and police officers say the same thing because more people tend to spontaneously go out on full moon nights. ER they nurses have a burst of too. energy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and patients that are normally catatonic start wailing and moaning and being more noisy on full moons. It is that feeling of upliftment that you get even for a few hours during a full moon where the gravity is actually pulling you in another direction that they're experiencing and you can visually see and you can walk outside and Hey, yep. It's a full moon. What do you think about the idea that the gravity is actually in the center of the crust? Because that's what Brooks Agnew theorizes about. Well, there is gravity in the center of the crust, but there's also gravity at the sun. So not everything coagulates to the center of the crust because you also have that extra pull there as well. If everything now, pulls towards you know, what he was going into is he just read the smoky God and kind of took the basics of the information there. Um, I have my opinions on Brooks Agnew. I'm not going to go into all of those things right now on your radio show, but I kind of think that he takes everything and takes it at face value and doesn't think much more into it. He's kind of like the hero coming in and he wants to do this polar expedition more for the fame than he wants to actually right. understand how it works. There's a lot of people like that out there. Possibly, but I've always seen him more as a scientist rather than going into um, too many theories. A lot of what he says is based on the little bit of fact that we're able to find out about the way the earth is formed. Yeah. So, Steven, uh, right, do we have you with us? Um, no, nope. still yeah. having some technical difficulties yeah. there. Okay. So, um, really quick, I also wanted to go into um, Olaf Jansen and Admiral Byrd, okay? Uh, Have you ever heard of Admiral Byrd before? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you know that... My specialty. Olaf Jansen is the person I would give credit with finding Hollow Earth and making it out. The poor man was thrown in an insane asylum <laughs> by his uncle after he got out and told the truth about what he had found. But then we have 
Admiral Byrd. And in 1936, interestingly enough, I found that he was invited, and this is on Waikiki, he was invited by the Germans to join them in their polar expeditions, but he declined it because he was a United States man. And then he had his flight inside, and what he was told in there was, hey, we need to drop nuclear weapons, we need to not do this and everything else. Then he went back to the United States and told him that, and they said, uh-uh, you're going to take an armada and you're going to go fight the Germans and you're going to get control of this situation. And he went down there and we got our butts handed to us. And what's interesting about that is very soon after that, we started doing polar flights around the poles with nuclear weapons right. and putting bases there. But they didn't really have a good, interestingly enough, they didn't have a good reason for that. So their reason was to call out a Cold War. And the reason that I think the Cold War is just a ruse, or was a ruse, uh, to keep the society in fear was so that they had reason to have these nuclear weapons at the polls. Uh, interestingly enough, I saw on another TV show where these these uh, this guy brought in some uh, missile keys to a pawn shop, and the missile keys were Russian, and the, guy, the expert came in and said, what's interesting about these is they're made of titanium, and America didn't have titanium during the Cold War, so Russia secretly gave NASA and the government here the titanium that they needed. And I thought, who does that? You know, if you're in a fight with your neighbor, are you going to go over and give them a gun so you guys can have a shootout? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. It, it, we're not going to have Russia giving us titanium unless secretly up at the higher echelon, you know, that, that they know that we're really not at war. But to the general public, it was real. So, that I, you know, the more digging I do, I just find out that the Cold War was nothing but a ruse, that the Ruskies were on our side, really, at the, at the top levels. Hmm. Donnie, you said your specialty was Admiral Byrd. Do you want to go into it a little bit? Sorry, I was I was mic'd there. Uh, yeah, yeah, Admiral Byrd, uh, you know, one of the great naval officers of our time, uh, you know, he, what he said when he was flying over the North Pole, and, and some people have said that the logs have been debunked, but this he wrote some very specific things as he flew into uh, into what he called the Hollow Earth. Uh, is you know he had stated that he had saw mammoths, he had saw dinosaurs, he had saw trees that had you know that were uh, as as high as skyscrapers. You know he was very vivid. In what he was, in what he was, uh, what he was journaling uh, as he flew into this this hole above the North Pole, uh, as he flew around it, and actually he kind of the only way that he could fly in is he had to kind of uh, arc the, the the plane and kind of uh, circle it around in a in a in a circular formation because of the way that the 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 actual hole itself was uh, was set up it's you know you had to be very good at aeronautics to get through it and and out of it as well uh but you know i believe that admiral Bird, admiral Bird and, and as you look deeper down into the history of of all of this i mean you know the navy itself wouldn't have done in their excursions into antarctica if it hadn't been for Admiral Byrd, I don't believe. I don't believe. I I, I don't believe it. I I, I think that uh, purely the intelligence that was given by Admiral Byrd at that time uh, is the reason why we are in Antarctica at this at this at this time. Well, and I isn't think there's, it true? There's, there's a lot to do with the Biru as well and the Hollow Earth. Isn't it true that um, uh, Prince William was sent to? Do patrolling down by Antarctica? He might have. Yeah, I With think the I remember reading that. I think he did, actually. Now that I, I, let me see if I can find that for you guys here. I'll make well, I, I, I was going to yeah. jump in with this. We have a set of birds down there that rather than flying south for the winter, they fly north. And they just disappear. Nobody knows where they go. Yeah, if, well, Stephen, if Stephen wasn't having, uh, you know, mic tech difficulties right now, he could go over that. But it's called the Arctic Turn. Uh, he just uh, typed that out for me here. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Do you want to do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? I I don't know much more about that. I wish he was coming on right now because uh, some of the interesting things he probably would have shared is in the nineteen sixties. 
uh, not only were we flying nuclear weapons, we dropped a few of them into that pole in uh, Baffin Bay area. And uh, it was one of the worst nuclear disasters of all time. And, and what they reported in public was that they just lost. I'm here the- now. Ah, there you go, Stephen. There you go. All right. Stephen can elaborate more on the Arctic term and uh, that uh, deal in the 1960s. And also, uh, he can tell you a little bit, uh, Chernobyl, an interesting thing about that, and I didn't get to go into the weather as much, but some of the radiation from uh, Chernobyl ended up uh, showing up at the South Pole within a few months. Now, how does that happen unless you know that there's a connection between the North Pole and the South Pole? Right, right. Stephen, do you want to take us away on that? Sure. Let's talk about the Arctic tern. It is the only bird that comes from uh, the the, uh, North Pole area, uh, eastern Siberia, that supposedly travels 12,000 miles, goes to the South Pole, but only stays there 11 days and flies back. It is the only bird that is seen near the Arctic Circle and the South Pole, but yet when I've seen some stories on it where people try to say that they flew only to the coast of Antarctica and not to the uh, the uh, Antarctic Circle, which was a lie. So if you were to travel with inside of the Earth, it is 8,900 8, miles as opposed to 12,000 miles If this bird flew at 45 miles an hour, it would take it 11 days consecutively. What they try to tell us, that this bird goes from uh, eastern Siberia and stops for 30 some odd days in the North Atlantic and then goes on further, makes its way going down towards uh, Antarctica, but only stays there 11 days, which I find preposterous to believe in. But it is my view and my belief that if we were to tag this bird with a video camera and a tracking device, what we would find out is that this bird does not travel on the outside of the Earth at night as they try to make us believe, but in the interior of the Earth and comes out on the South Pole exit. And we would then find out that there is definitely a inner Earth, just as well as Jan Lamprick said that when Chernobyl uh, went off, two years later at the South Pole only, there were remnants, they found traces of uh, radiation only near the poles, which suggests that the Earth has to be hollow. That actually does make sense. Well, I think a hollow Earth makes a lot more sense than plate tectonics, either that or expanding Earth. But Well, in, in expanding or shrinking. You right, know, right. Both but, things could be happening. But Donnie, let me ask you this. You're an astronomer. You've been looking up at the stars for years and years and years. Any indication yeah. that any other planets, objects, anything like that, moons, um, stars, anything might be hollow? Well, um, they do say that uh, one of Jupiter's moons might be might be hollow. Uh, they they have stated that it has a water core, which is weird. How well, could you have a water core? If I remember and, correctly, NASA fired a rocket up to the moon. Yes. And the moon actually rang back, denoting it rang like hollow. a bell. Yeah. But then there's the other line of thinking that the moon is completely artificial. But I think a good piece of evidence would be to show another planetoid object, moon, anything like that, which is also hollow. So we can turn around and say, okay, well, it is possible for planets to be hollow. If you look hard enough, you're going to find the pictures on YouTube. Um, look. Uh, look up um, South Pole from outer space, and you're going to actually find one where it shows the South Pole of the moon from outer space. And you can see a concept- concentric bunch of circles going into a dark spot at the base of the moon. That's obviously a hole in the moon, too. One of the things I proposed as a theory on this hollow Earth theory is that not only is the moon hollow, um, but I believe that one side of the moon is more dense than the other side, and that that's why the moon seems to always face in one direction, that as it goes around the Earth, that it's literally just facing the sun all the time. And, you know, they do say that it it spins in a circle, but I'm beginning to wonder if it spins at all or if it just stays stationary except for orbits around the Earth. 
and always faces the outer sun in, in one direction because it's more, it's cooled with one dense side that's more dense than the other. Well, Chris, you know, to add to that, uh, Ken Johnston from NASA, he himself has told me that he believes that the moon is hollow based on his research. So there are people like himself, you've got other people who are from that program who are aware that the, the, the moon very way very well may be hollow, as well as some other planets in our solar system. Well, I, I was just reading something right here. Uh, it was talking about all planets being hollow. Oh, yeah. The moon, all planets. I, I had a guy email me, and he, he said he was from uh, Greece, and he wanted to tell me that they, in their mythology, that Saturn is called Kronos in Latin, and it's the home of Zeus and the gods. Right. And that they came back and that they were the ones that actually fought with the the Anunnaki here over us and destroyed the fountain causing the flood to flood the face of the earth because they were upset that we are like their cousins but we're we're a lot smaller and they came in and they kicked out the bullies. You know, I've heard that before. Whenever I was a kid, my science teacher, you know, our science teachers were private school science teachers, so they were obligated to provide the religious uh, version of history. And she said that there was a flood because there was a canopy that was hanging over the earth. And when God got angry, he poked a hole in it real quick. (laughs) And it all came tumbling down and killed all the people. And I was like, wow, that's horrible. (laughs) This is well, why I have know, found more dropouts to be a lot more intellectual and more educated than a lot of scholars that I've talked to. <laughs> well, I really want you know, to touch something really quick before we run out of time. It's really important for people to understand. When I was a kid, I always used to wonder how does cold air steam or you know evaporation from the ocean make it up to the North Pole? And then create snow and weather and come back. Because my science teacher always told me the weather forms at the poles. Well, what happens is warm air is rushing out of the earth. And it's warm, steamy, tropical air. The inner earth temperature hangs at about 75 degrees, give or take a couple degrees Fahrenheit constant all the time. All the time. Okay, it's, it's tropical paradise in there. And this warm steam rushes out while cold air rushes in, and that is what flash freezes in the snow. It's also what gives us our wintertime strong west to east directional wind pattern in the north and the opposite in the south. And what gets caught in the middle are these mini vortexes in the middle of these big giant vortexes caused by these polar, polar vortexes, and we get the hurricanes and we get tornadoes and things like that. What you'll notice in the summer is clouds can go anywhere they want. They kind of mildly, slowly go from west to east, but sometimes they can back up and go the other direction, where they can't do that in the wintertime. In the wintertime, it's strong west to east, and that's because this polar vortex is in full swing. So just wanted to throw that out before we ran out. Mm. I would and just like to end. Driven by the need to keep the inner Earth, the inner Earth sun, in check because if it didn't have this cooling system between all these large cave systems in the world and these polar vortexes, it would heat out of control. And what keeps that inner sun hot is the tug of the moon going around and pulling it against the outer sun gravity. It stretches and squeezes it. It stretches and squeezes it. It is not a gamma ray sun. It's just a big ball of whatever was the heaviest that, that transferred to the middle. It's everything just like we have here. And what's uh, interesting is that salt is rare on the inside of the earth, but gold, crystal, all their heavy metals like iron and nickel are not. There's an interesting deal where the Hopi Indians would trade to Middle Earth. Remember I was telling you that there's Middle Earth and then there's Hollow Earth. They would trade to these ant people in Middle Earth salt in return for gold. And then the gold would go you know, to the outside and they didn't need it. So they would stockpile it and guess where our government put their base? right on top of the Hopi Indians land and confiscated all their gold. Right, right. Yeah. It's almost and as if they look for, for things like that. They had a gentleman who found a bunch of gold in another area just north of the base in the 20s 
and gold bullion was legal to own. He asked for rights to the land, and guess what? The government expanded their base right over the top of it. But that you can look up that archival Unsolved Mysteries show, and that's real. You know, also, too, Chris, I like to say here, I've got a video out on YouTube called Arctic Secrets Revealed. And it's regarding Olaf Jansen's eyewitness account. He claims there are many rivers, entryways from the Arctic Circle region. There are over 12 rivers that are there up in the Arctic Circle, all fresh water, that all go in to the inner earth. You know, hold that thought, guys. I'm going to bring you on for the next three minutes left. Um, Chris, anything you want to leave the audience with? Um, no, just uh, thank you for having me on. Hopefully we'll get to talk again soon. Maybe we'll do another short show down the road. Um, but anyways, uh, the main thing is Center Stars channel everything. So centerstarschannel.webs.com and Center Stars channel at YouTube, Daily Motion and Wire Club, soon to be Facebook. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. We appreciate it. Steven, your websites? My website's oh gee, uh, stevensworldtv.com. Uh, I'm on youtube.com uh, forward slash w e b f l i x s uh, guy, webflix guy, and uh, youtube.com forward slash Sindoni Productions. Excellent. We appreciate it. And Donnie Gilson, tell us what's coming up for 32 Degrees of Insanity. Well, we're, uh, you know, you're just going to have to tune in to see uh, on Wednesday and Monday, uh, 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, going all the way till midnight on Freedomizer Radio Network. Excellent, Donnie. We appreciate your time this evening. Hey, man, no problem. Anytime. Thanks. Thanks to the great round panel of guests we had this evening, ladies and gentlemen. And don't go anywhere because we still have seven coming up. year to the day last year on april 23rd of 2011 i went to the denver museum of nature and science in denver colorado and you live locally i don't know if you've been to that museum yet Have no you? we've only been here about a year so we haven't had too much yeah. time to explore well, check yet. it out it's pretty neat um they have this thing called the space odyssey center and being that i was really starting to get interested in the hollow earth i wanted to just go in and see if any of their pictures showed uh auroras at the poles and showed any pole holes at the poles of the planets. And they had a brand new display in there um, that was a silkscreen display that I later found out that they can put images of the sun or the different planets on there. But what they had on there that day was a silkscreen globe of the Earth. And a gentleman next to me wanted to see Alaska, and they tilted it down. And all they showed in the north for any representation was just open water. Um, I ran around behind the wall just hoping to see Alaska, or sorry, not Alaska, but Antarctica down there. And uh All right, we are firing through, and thank you for everybody tuning in to this new showtime every Friday and Saturdays, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. Central Standard Time. Is it standard? I don't know. Maybe it's not standard. 8 p.m. Central? Yeah, Central Time. Mm -hmm. Why did I say standard? I'm just all messed up from 420 yesterday. I'm sorry <laughs> about that, ladies and gentlemen. But um, we are going to ex extend the broadcast an extra hour for you guys. So we'll be going until midnight Central Time. But right now we have Chris Barrett who's going to be joining us. But first, Donnie Gilson is going to write Shotgun with us for the first hour and talk about the hollow earth with Chris. Donnie, how are you doing? Hey, how are you guys? Oh, doing great, doing great. You're working on a new video, aren't you? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm uh, I'm an intense research man. I uh, have come across some really odd stuff. We were up until we were broadcasting last night until about close to four in the morning, five in the morning, and all kinds of different networks. Let me ask you this: your opinion on Hollow Earth, real quick, before we run Chris on. Um, I am a I, I'm an avid believer in the Hollow Earth theory. I don't uh, I I believe in subterranean. Uh, uh, People, I believe in subterranean civilizations. Uh, one of one of the uh, people that I've worked with over my life is a lady named Diane Robbins. Uh, she is uh, uh, a channeler who has. Uh, uh, spoken with people from the underground uh, civilization called Telos, which is supposedly below Mount Chasta. Ah, yes, I've heard about that. And as a matter of fact, that's where Stephen Sindoni was talking about an entrance to the hollow earth in Mount Shasta. And Chris Barrett is a good friend of Stevens and is going to elaborate on the hollow earth. Chris, do we, do we have you with us? 
Yeah, I do. First off, thank you for having me on. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know too much about you. So tell the audience, please, and myself too, a little bit about yourself and if you have any websites, anything like that. Well, uh, first off, um, my name's Chris Baird. I go by Center Star. So I have Stent Center Star's channel on YouTube, on uh, Daily Motion, on Wire Club, which is another forum like Facebook. Uh, not Facebook yet. I'm under Christopher Baird on Facebook, but I'm going to put a Center Stars channel there too as well. And I just recently started a website with the help of my friend Steve Sandoni, and it's centerstarschannel.webs.com. And uh, pretty much uh, what I've been doing is, well, let, let me go back a little bit. What happened was I had just stumbled across Hollow Earth. I was doing some spiritual searching and some research and i went from place to place to place on videos just watching things and i stumbled across one of steven's videos which was on the smoky god and it talks about the story of jans and olaf jansen and uh their journey to hollow earth well about six months after this i went and, and, and almost while well, we were having a lot of fun, but, uh, yeah, we are uh, I, I'm, I'm going deep into research right now. So another video is going to be coming out fairly shortly. Oh, nice. Nice. Can you give us a little sneak peek on it? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, what we've been talking about now is the possibility of this, uh, this gas giant in between, uh, Neptune and, uh, Uranus. Uh, but, uh, we have now, uh, taken a look at, uh, a couple other elements, uh, down at near Mars station that gives us uh, a weird planet is rising from, uh, near Mars Station in the east uh, through cloud cover. So it means that this object is a little closer than we than we think, and uh, it, it haps, happens to be in the same precise area where Mercury is, but of course we can't see Mercury in the sky. Uh, so what is this planet? Uh, we are going to investigate it, and we are going to find out something very, very interesting when we go to the exact coordinates of where this, uh, this uh, particular object is. Huh. That's all very strange. 